Hey everybody, this is So Many Sequels. I'm Josh. I'm Garrett. And I'm David. It is the beginning of A24 April on the show. Very excited about a whole month of mm-hmm. A24 movies. This week on the show we're talking about Swiss Army Man, which is Garrett's pick. Later he's going to tell us why he picked this, but first, uh, David is going to tell us how this movie did in the box office. Now to start things off, we'll read a quick synopsis of this film from Letterboxd. Swiss Army Man was directed by the Daniels, uh, who most recently, just a year past, won uh, Best Picture and Best Director at the Oscars for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Um, Alone on a tiny deserted island, Hank has given up all hope of ever making it home again. But one day everything changes when a dead body washes ashore and he soon realizes it may be his last opportunity to escape certain death. Armed with his new friend and an unusual bag of tricks, the duo go on an epic adventure to bring Hank back to the woman of his dreams. Knowing what it's about, did people go see this movie, David? Well, it's sort of uh, hard to say. So the movie opened June 24th, uh, 26. Um, And in its opening weekend, it was only in three theaters. So it brought in only $105,000 at the box office, uh, finishing in the number 28 spot. Um, Now, it would eventually get a wider release to 600 theaters, about 630 theaters, um, on the weekend of the 4th of July. It bumped all the way up to the number 11 spot, bringing in $1.4 million, like I said, finishing at number 11, Behind Finding Dory, The Legend of Tarzan, The Purge, Election Year, uh, The BFG, and Independence Day Resurgence, a geriatric sequel that I don't know if anybody really wanted. Um, some other big movies that were in the theater that week, you had The Conjuring 2, uh, Central Intelligence uh, with Kevin Hart and uh, Dwayne Johnson, uh, Now You See Me 2, which I think also had Daniel Radcliffe in it. So yes, that had two, two Daniel Radcliffe movies in the same uh, weekend. Um, the movie, so like I said, was never really in major wide releases, so it only finished 2016 with $4.2 million at the box office, $700,000 overseas for a worldwide total of $4,900,000. Um, that domestic number of $4.2 million was good enough for the number 163 spot on the year, um, which, uh, if you guys remember back to 2016, the number one movie of the year was uh, Rogue One, a Star Wars story, followed by the aforementioned Finding Dory, Captain America Civil War, The Secret Life of Pets, The Jungle Book. So a lot of big hitters that year. You had several movies. Um, this was the prime of, you know, this, this is a great time for the box office in terms of movie going. Lots of movies making over $100 million. Uh, there was 30 movies that year that made over $100 million. So this was that uprise before, we, before the pandemic um, where we just, you know, Theaters are killing it. Um, that's about it for this week. The only other detail I'll add is that this is the uh, number 15 movie for Daniel Radcliffe in terms of his global box office hauls, the 15th highest grossing movie for him. Um, number one's, well, number one through eight is the Harry Potter franchise, as you might imagine. So uh, that's it for this week. All right. This week on the show, we're talking about Swiss Army Man, uh, a 24 movie from 2016 starring Paul Dano, and Daniel Radcliffe as a very unusual pair, as we discussed. Uh, Garrett, this was your pick. What made you pick this one? You know, uh, when we decided to do A24, this is really the first movie that I remember being like, what is this studio? Like, I feel like they had done some stuff before that that I'd seen, probably paid attention to, but everything had been so interesting or weird and they just took a lot of risks. And I think that's what really stood out for me about this movie in particular is that there's a lot of big, big swings here from a lot of big people. You got the Daniels in their first directorial debut. And for me, rewatching it, you can see where they would end up. You know, knowing what we know now, going back and watching this movie, I see a lot of influence in how they tell stories and the weird stuff that they like to implement and, and really lean into it. And then the continuation of. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe's evolution post Harry Potter. Um, I was really into What If. Uh, It's one of my favorite movies of his. And um, this 
falling on the heels of that, I really appreciated him really just being willing to do anything. And so when I hear that there's a movie out with him in a farting corpse or as a farting corpse, I'm like, what? (laughs) I'm going to go see that. Absolutely. You mean to tell me? Yes. You mean to tell me this kid who's been Harry Potter his whole life is out here just being a farting corpse? I love that for him. Let me go see this. (laughs) And it turned out that it had, you know, more depth than it sounds. Um, It doesn't necessarily go as deep as, again, the Daniels will learn how to get with everything everywhere all at once with their strange story storytelling and, and how to be able to connect with it. But there are moments in this movie where it's like, why is this connecting with me? <laughs> and then there are moments where it's like, why isn't this doing much of anything for me? Um, um, so, and honestly, I knew David hadn't seen it and I didn't necessarily want to disturb him with a horror movie, but I thought, man, if I'm really going to give him an A24 moment, this is going to be it. So that also was a factor into this as well. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. Well, I also saw Swiss Army Man before. I think I saw it. I think Garrett and I both saw it together originally when we, the first time. So yeah. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll I'll save mine for last. Let's go ahead and hear from David, who had never seen this movie. Oh, okay. I think because I'm just going to probably say what Garrett says. Let's be real. We both saw the movie. All right. <laughs> Uh, uh go ahead yeah all right you know don't know how this is gonna go all right here is my cinephile card i am prepared to turn it in if, if this doesn't go the way that uh i hope it goes but um you know i didn't really like it uh it was it was so confounding because it was it was weird and it was gross it was it was very well made and it had like you said Garrett moments of really like incredible depth and yet it's just something about like you know yeah we'll get into some of the some of the more gross out stuff but something about it just kind of just had me turned off kind of pretty early on and it just really never entirely got me back but i can totally see what you're talking about with this being a very oh what's the word it's a very primitive look at what the daniels will become at least you know as we've seen them and you know as of 2022 um i wonder i'm very curious to see what their next project will be if they do a project together again i don't know why they would split up now but um so i think this is one of those movies that's like I can I can appreciate what it is, what it's trying to do, um, while just kind of saying like it, whatever it was trying to do doesn't really gel with me. This is not this is this is the antithesis of cool guys doing cool crimes, which we've established as my favorite subgenre. Uh, so I don't know, I don't know. I didn't like it, but I'm really interested to talk more about it because I think it is a movie that causes you to have conversations. So what did you think, Josh? <laughs> I really like this movie. Uh, I like the weirdness of it. Uh, I came at it from the same angle Garrett did of like, why is Harry Potter farting? Uh, I gotta see this movie. What is going on? Um, and it... it <laughs> I guess it met my expectations in that regard of not knowing... I cannot get this thing to sit still. Of not knowing what my expectations were. Um, this movie came out eight years ago, I realized, which is deeply, deeply upsetting. Uh huh. <laughs> and I found it more profound now, I think, because of just lived experience and whatnot. Um, this idea of this man who is, yeah, doing whatever it takes to get back home in some way because you know when we start out he's he has given up uh he's about to hang himself and daniel radcliffe washes ashore and changes everything so it's interesting to see how he reacts to that kind of hope it turns him around completely and then just seeing him go throughout this movie rediscovering what he loves about life by teaching this corpse 
is just something that I probably wasn't ready for eight years ago, <laughs> I think, and felt a little stronger now. Now, is it still exceptionally silly? Yeah, it's very goofy. It's it's nowhere near the Daniel's best work. Um, it It's just a little too weird, I think. Uh, you know, this movie wasn't nominated for Best Picture by any means. <laughs> but Could I... Could you imagine if it was? Holy crap. I know. No, no <laughs> pun intended. I still really like it, and I really like that they were able to tell this story as weird as it is. So, Garrett? Yeah, so let's talk about the story in and of itself. You mentioned uh, we we see Paul Dano there on the shore about to hang himself, and and then uh, washed up upon the shore is corpse of Daniel Radcliffe. If you will, think Tom Hanks when he meets Wilson. You know, that's essentially what we're going for here. You know, we don't necessarily get into the backstory deeply of Paul Dano's character and what drove him really to be in this situation. And if we did, I'd certainly don't remember being a part of the movie, but um, you don't necessarily need it. Um, oh, it's you get that Sorry. you get that he's lonely. You get that he's, you know, by himself and isolated at and, and, and yeah. at the end. Yeah. And so he's just looking for this connection. You know, he sees this person wash ashore and, uh, it's a corpse and all of a sudden this corpse exhibits a bunch of different magical powers as it reanimates over time. Uh, Dana Radcliffe can like spit up water. His, his penis is a compass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he starts to talk and, and, uh, Paul Dano, it's basically, uh, having a baby who is an adult who can talk, you know, what is happening. And then he's trying to explain life to this newborn corpse. Um, and so, I, you know, I've seen a lot of reviews talk about how, you know, the, the corpse is a mirror for Paul Dano. And that's, you know, through this, you see moments that scene on the bus for me is one where, um, he's lit, he's trying to encourage Daniel Radcliffe's character to do the things that he wishes he could do. Uh -huh. And then he, he at least admits, you know, I would never actually do that myself. And I thought that was a really powerful moment in this. what did you guys think of that? You know, um, I kind of, I kind of, or, you know, I started off by saying, you know, I thought that this was probably, this is the smartest dumb movie I've ever watched. This is the most beautiful gross movie I've ever watched. It's the most thoughtful, annoying movie I've ever watched. <laughs> uh, like you guys have said, it's very nice to see someone who's lost their appreciation for life rediscover it through the eyes of a dead man. Like, that's such an interesting idea and i thought the ways they executed that idea at times were really profound the bus scene is really is really profound creepy and also very weird but you know those were the moments that i thought were highlights here and i thought that um sort of like the 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 where the daniels elite really i think showed their depth here with the story is how they combine the editing that they did with that the sort of back and forth of like dano's talking to Dan he's talking to manny hank is talking to manny through his ear but he's also visualizing himself as the woman as it comes through it's all very interestingly you know put together the music being mostly composed of daniel radcliffe and paul bit dano singing um you know, it just, it all f comes together and it, you know, it manipulates you into like feeling that zest, that realness. Um, and then, you know, they'll cut you off with something uh, really gross, like Daniel Radcliffe, uh, like, like Paul Dano shaving his beard into Daniel Radcliffe's mouth. Like it's <laughs> all, <laughs> every time the movie wanted to, what, almost, uh, you know, it was starting to get me. I was like, ah, oh, yuck. <laughs> it was something like that, but. No, I agree. I, I agree. I, the bus scene is the one that I think really stands out in my mind uh, specifically. Um, also, just a recreation of all this stuff in the woods, very Flintstone or very uh, Gilligan's Island stuff. That's what was impressive to me was the how Hank built these scenes just to teach Manny uh, about life and try to help inspire him to remember his life before he died. Uh, yeah, that bus scene is, is a favorite of mine as well. Um, I, I just like seeing him. There's a part where there's a close up of 
uh, Manny's face and he's just kind of like up against a window and it's just like, I don't know what that is, saran wrap maybe. And then he's got this conveyor belt magazine pages going through to be the scenery going by. It's awesome. Then yeah, you remember exactly. he fights. He's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, and You're then... Right. Well, and then it's something weird, like, you know, his erection is a compass, which, incidentally, that's where I lost Nikki with this movie. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> Honestly, know, fair. I get that. You know, that scene is that a, scene is very weird. It is. It's not a movie to watch with your parents. I'll put that out there. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a very, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting because that stuff is there in everything, everywhere, all at once. You think about the sausage fingers, and you think about the guy who's... Uh, Oh, what there at some point in everything there's a guy who his uh his multiverse moment is he has to like uh impale himself on a dildo or something like that. It was like the, like this the weird stuff is still there. They still do that. Yeah. But I think they got a lot better at balancing it uh between this movie and that movie. Um which granted this is only that's only their second movie. So they've come a long way in however many you know um 7 years, however long the distance is between those two films. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's. All- I want to talk about some of the things that uh, Daniel Radcliffe or uh, Manny was able to do. And David, mm-hmm. you had mentioned some of the gross out scenes, so please uh, feel free to jump in at any yeah. point in time. Feel free to start vomiting. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got the water jet propulsion where he farts his way across like a jet ski. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's usually the way he travels. That's his main mode of transportation. Mm-hmm. Uh, fresh. He's a fresh water source. He provides uh, Hank well. with water throughout filter. the whole movie. His <laughs> penis is a compass and mm-hmm. that is usually activated by looking at the picture of the woman of the fo- on the phone, mm-hmm. Sarah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's a projectile launcher, mm-hmm. which is just kind of crazy. Yeah, he can shoot as a uh, gun a, or as a mm-hmm. yes. Uh, what was the other one? Like a harpoon when he like Batman the, batarang. Yeah, yeah harpoon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's a fire starter mm-hmm. with his hand. Uh, yeah, he's got a karate like body <laughs> he's, chop yeah, thing, he's chopping whole trees in half. He's uh, he can sing, which is lovely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What else? Is there anything that I'm his missing? His teeth or anything? can be used as a razor blade. His teeth can be used as a razor blade. That was one that mm-hmm. stood out to you, yeah. It did. It was a very. It was. It was a moment of sheer disgustingness of looking at all that beard hair in Daniel Radcliffe's mouth. I just immediately my my tongue felt itchy, just looking at it. He does not, have <laughs> you know, I think know anything about Jurassic Park. Did not. No. Now, no. the Paul Dano, this fool re- reenacted the whole movie for him on a little screen in Titanic and other several other movies as well. He did. I really appreciated the how they used those kinds of things throughout the movie. It was mm-hmm. funny to hear them just kind of recall those uh, uh, Cotton Eye Joe, those renditions yeah. of Cotton Eye Joe whenever they would pop up. Yeah. Man, that was so funny it, it, and unexpected every single time. It felt very much like the use of, uh, oh gosh, this is the story of a girl, you oh, know. Yeah. Yeah, from, uh, from everything, where like it, it, they 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 kept coming back on that, and they they spun it around like in Paul Dano's or uh, Radcliffe is singing Cotton Eye Joe, but as sort of like a sentimental mel- you know uh, uh, lullaby <laughs> type mm-hmm. thing at times. Um, yeah, and at one point they just literally just use like it's Daniel Radcliffe and Paul Dano doing it. But they just do the Jurassic Park theme as like the 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 music for I think the bus scene, the one we were talking about. They're just you know. They're just singing da 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 da. You yeah. know, they're just doing the whole thing, uh, which is you know, uh, funny in its own way. I I think that a lot of the going back to Manny and all of his Swiss Army abilities, a lot of that you know they're so over the top and extreme, and I feel like a lot of it is this movie is is one of their messages is is trying to embrace you mm-hmm. and find you again, and mm-hmm. uh, they did a lot of these over the top things as because people always feel like they have some kind of quirk that makes them feel insecure. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very normal thing. And I think their idea with this is to be able to embrace who you are. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe your teeth can't actually suffice as a razor blade or something like that. But like, that is a helpful thing for, uh, Hank in this situation where he's trapped and by himself. And so like doing that and then, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. It's weird. That was the thing that they said all of this throughout the movie. Um, but they were trying to, you know, accept the situation for what uh, it was and, and show, you know, you are who you are and that's good. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, again, is it For done sure. well every single time? No. Uh, but I think there are moments, and I think that doing it to such extremes um, can both highlight and take away from the message that they're trying to, to convey. Yeah, and I, I want to talk about, if I can sidetrack off of Hello, because I think it's a great point. The more you think about it, the more I think you can draw from it. Um, <clears throat> there was a there was a feeling I had for a while of what exactly is happening, what exactly is going on. Is this literally? Is this to be taken literal that it's a a, a corpse is slowly coming back to life and is capable of these super powers? There was a a good chunk of the movie where I thought we were getting like an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge situation where the movie's going to end with Paul Dano hanging himself and all of that was his final vision before he before he died. Um. So, like, instead of seeing his life before his eyes, he just got this moment of life sort of that flashed because he didn't have a great life before he died. You know what I mean? Like, I was expecting something like that. I was expecting, you know, they showed a brief clip of Daniel Radcliffe imagining himself decomposing. And I was like, I was imagining, like, he's going to show up in at, at somewhere and, like, Daniel Radcliffe's body is going to be like a, a shriveled skeleton. And people are going to be like, what the hell happened out there? Or something like that. When you guys watched this the first time, were you asking yourself those same kind of questions of like, what's actually happening here? Like, is this literal or is it metaphorical? What's exactly happening? I think it's I think happening. I think that deep most of the time. <laughs> I think it's happening. Oh, you think it's I happening? Do. I do. And you can't say you don't think that deep when you were all going on that stuff about being you and all that stuff. Like, that was, that you was asked, good. You asked about the first time. The first time when I saw this movie eight years ago, I don't think I thought that deep. No. <laughs> Me neither. I, no. I certainly did not. Um, I think the answer is some. I think the I think the end of this movie, and I think I thought of this this time. You know, I think the end of this movie, and really makes you feel like the answer is somewhere in between, right? Like, and I think that is also a message, because when you go from the fantasy world that they were living in, in the woods crash into the reality and then you have that moment of this hope or like whatever you know you're thinking man i'm really wanting paul dano's character to to get back into it and find his way and and get back into this life and then he crashes into reality where he's got this shortcut on his phone to the instagram page of this woman who's married and has a family that he's been kind of like not stalking but kind of stalking on a bus um and then ends up at her house and Mm -hmm. and then it's like oh no this is not good this is not good and then he and then at the very end spoilers daniel radcliffe farts his way away (laughs) Mm -hmm. and that leads them to believe some of his crazy stories right Mm -hmm. and so i think the answer is that there is it's somewhere in between yeah the the thing the fantastical thing that he's saying sounds crazy but there's some truth into it Mm -hmm. and then the reality is not what he was telling (laughs) manny and not what we were presented and the, and those clash a lot of times and so i think it's uncomfortable there at the end but i think that it's a good message if you can follow it what do you think josh because i was thinking as i was watching it this is gonna be a hard one to get out of in the end like how do you finish this movie yeah um well i definitely wanted to talk about the reveal that Sarah is not somebody that Manny knows from his life or at all and is really somebody that uh, like Eric said is already married and has somebody and is happy and that alone is uh, kind of odd because you're like okay well wh- what's what's going on here and then of course we get the second reveal that Sarah was a person that Hank was pining, pining over, for. I guess is the word I would use. Um, yeah, would yeah. would kind of like ride the same bus as her and had his eye on her. And he had been wanting to have be the one who could like have the courage to talk to her. But instead he didn't. And he found her on Instagram and he just follows her life from afar. And then it gets really sad because you're like, oh, no. Uh, everything we Hank spends so much time teaching Manny about life that you forget that this movie started with Hank about to kill himself and then you come Mm -hmm. back to that Mm -hmm. reality that oh Hank is not uh, okay 
uh, and what he's going through is not okay. So I I think that in that regard, there's a little bit left to be desired from me at the end because we don't really know what happens there. But I do agree that with Garrett that there's a reason why we have everybody out there watching Manny fart his way into the sunset uh, because some aspect of of Hank's story needed to be true to, to the mm-hmm. to the rescuers and the witnesses and all that I guess so I still like to think the whole thing is true but I do believe at least he farted away <laughs> yeah and that's the thing is by the end I, that's what, that's where I came to is like well okay that it, it's it did happen, or at least, at least as yeah, far as they're Hank's all like, concerned, it happened. The? Unless everybody's reacting, so unless Hank is imagining all of this too, or something, you right. know, it's it seems pretty clear. They're like, yeah, it's a real magic corpse. Um, I did. I, I, there was a time where, uh, as we were watch, as I was watching, I thought that a more interesting reveal would be that Manny was the guy that was in those other pictures, and he hadn't even realized while he was interacting with him, like if like. If the other person that had washed up on the shore had been Mary Winstead's uh, husband or boyfriend or something like that, that could have been an interesting uh, trauma reveal too. But um, but otherwise, yeah, I thought it was good. I mean, I don't know. It was uh, it was a very interesting story that I thought had a hard way to end. I, I just and I, I still think that way. I think it's kind of hard to uh, just wrap that kind of movie the movie up as it plays out. And so, like when that when that credit rolls or when that you know the end hits, I was kind of like, uh, but now what? Because like uh, you bit. know he potentially, I was like Paul Dano really needs help. You know Hank really needs some mental help right now. So I hope he's getting help wherever he is. Yeah, unfortunately he's terrorizing Gotham City. <laughs> yes, yes. Now as uh, the Riddler. Uh, any other standout moments from this movie you guys want to cover? talk about i don't necessarily if I know if i want to talk about moments okay. in it, but like for me the uh i think the moments that we've talked about again they they hit with you and me josh a little more than they did with david but mm-hmm. i think that this movie does a really good job of showing you what writers directors and actors can do when they just come together and work together really well and i think that all of these people worked really well together and i think it shows on the screen i think that Paul Dano delivers a really great performance. I think Daniel Radcliffe delivers a really great performance. And I think it's directed really well um, by people who just believed in their project and believed that it was okay to be silly and just really lean into what they were given. And that, to me, I think is why I really enjoy this movie, despite the fact that it's it's super weird. It's super silly. It's so over the top. But I also can tell that every single person that's involved with this is having a great time, and I can feel that, and I enjoy that, and I appreciate that, because you don't always get that in these in this world of corporate, you know, crank them out formulaic kind of movies. You don't get that mm-hmm. same feeling. And so for me, feeling the moments from Paul and Daniel and Mary Elizabeth Winstead and the Daniels. It's, it's, I just really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, the Daniels had said that, um, when they were casting this movie, they'd already had Paul Dano and Paul had mentioned that he wanted to work with Daniel. And so they reached out to him that way. And then they said that, uh, Daniel loved the script so much that he asked if he could do his own stunts. Uh, yeah. so He's kind of a weird there's guy. a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of this movie that they made a dummy, a corpse for, that they did not use because Daniel was like, no, nah, I want to be the corpse. Other than like the scene where he's on fire, I think it, they said. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Daniel wanted... You mean to tell me that man can fart like a jet ski nah, in real life? Those were all his real farts. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what that means. <laughs> he's a wizard. He is yeah. a wizard, literally. <laughs> but anyway, no, I think that goes uh, on... that validates what you're saying though that these are people who came together and worked well together and wanted mm-hmm. to make this together so and to, if i can jump off what you guys are saying i want to the last thing i want to touch on is the a24 aspect of this is that a24 as a company whether or not i've seen a lot of their movies whether or not i find most of them to be spooky uh they're a company that they're the only ones that would green light this 
and frankly, they sh- probably should be the only ones that greenlight this kind of movie. It's a, uh, it's an opportunity for filmmakers, actors, creators, whoever, writers to get stuff made that normally normally wouldn't get made. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great uh, thing to have in the ecosystem of Hollywood. Um, and so, um, you know, they took a chance on this. And, it, you know, it did well at Sundance. The Daniels have been working um, at the Sundance Labs for years, you know, kind of trying to slowly per- perfect their craft and all that. So, like, I think that uh, as far as where A24 comes in, they recognize these guys had something, had talent, had a good story, had some actors. Now, you know, I think that they probably, it probably at the end of the day was probably too strange for them to, you know, distribute to a really wide audience. Hence, uh, what we talked about in box office ads, it was never in more than about 600 theaters. So it's a hard sell, but, you know, that's their niche is movies that are kind of a hard sell. And so, like, you know, you're going to find the people who really like it when you do that yep yep what what are our final ratings for this movie gonna be uh since i'll i'll probably gonna bring up the rear i'll, I'll just go first no pun intended say, again yes yes uh, you know i saw too much of daniel radcliffe's rear in this movie frankly uh frankly? and uh his frankly his hairy cheeks um it <laughs> was uh it was gross it was thoughtful. Mm-hmm. It was. Uh, I found myself rooting for the bear at one point, but <laughs> I still, I still uh, have a high amount of respect for the people who did it. I've done some readjusting to my letterbox rating system, and so this falls into a uh, well made, but di- but I didn't like it. Three stars for me. Join Hereditary and her <laughs> in the three stars. It's nice, but I didn't like it. Move the category. Dang. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um you know what i don't necessarily disagree with your analysis there david um that's the funny <laughs> thing about this movie um for me again i de- i definitely think that there are so many big swings there and i think that they hit like a ground rule double most of the time <laughs> <laughs> and um it you know th- we I didn't necessarily talk about it but this is an hour and a half long ish movie and it felt a little long and that's never great for me um you know so i think that there were moments where it just really felt good and then it kind of dragged and then it felt good and then it dragged um but it's really well made it's really well made everything comes together well as long as you are able to lean into the weirdness um but um for me it is a uh, three and a half mm. that is a very good movie for me okay okay uh I really enjoyed it upon a second viewing. Uh, like I said, I think I found deeper meaning in it this time. Um, so I'm going to give it four stars. It's a four-star movie for me. Know. Full four stars. Full okay. four stars. Uh, and I double-checked, and that's what I gave it in 2016 as well. So. Oh, okay. Nice. So, you so consistent. consistent. Nothing but consistent. So, uh, the- Guys, do I need to turn in my cinephile card or what? Ah, I don't out? think I so. Out? This movie can't Is, be for everyone. Do I need to take the letterbox hat back? <laughs> nah. No, no. I'm sure there are worse opinions you could have. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't even ever talked about paranormal activities. So That's right. We'll get there one day. Alrighty, it's time to play the letterbox game where each of us is going to take a stab at where we think the letterbox community has rated the movie of the week, Swiss Army Man, on a 0 to 5 scale. Um, we're going to go round the circle here. David is our two, two-time two champion. Uh, I don't remember the standings in, mm-hmm. in regards to who goes first. What's the order this week? Josh, you're actually in last. That means you going for, you're going first this week. So I will be going first this week, and then who? Yeah, I mean, I should start back. This is what the prize is right here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's the prize. Uh, anyway. Uh, I managed to storm back last week with a direct hit. You did. So. We'll see if anybody gets mm-hmm. a direct hit this week for Swiss Army Man. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the most popular reviews for this movie. I honestly can't wait. I feel that these could only be amazing. Um, we're mm-hmm. going to start out with the top review, uh, which is four and a half stars. You can't spell fart without art. And honestly, put that on the poster. Put that on the Blu-ray mm-hmm. case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Who said three that? Star, 
<laughs> Three stars. Mary Elizabeth Winstead. What the fuck? Me. I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can feel it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then finally, four and a half stars. Legend has it that this movie was the true and irrevocable origin of the term artsy fartsy. But up, but up. Oh boy, that's the. There's a theme here. There's a theme in the. There's a theme. People love farts. Mm -hmm. All time fart record on this episode. So I'm going to say this also. Nikki read me a review from Letterboxd that said, um, this is like if the two kids that thought turning their eyelids inside out at the lunch table was funny, it's like if they wrote a movie together. Oh my gosh. Okay, wait. I lied. There's. <laughs> I First of all, I see that one as I'm scrolling. But Oh yeah? Uh, there was another one. This is the last one. Four and a half stars. <laughs> I relate very heavily to the Swiss Army man, as I, too, fear I will be far more useful when I'm dead. <laughs> uh, Self-deprecation is fun, but we don't, we, no, come on, guys. My guess is now, like, very, like, I'm very scared of my guess now. It, it can be all over the place. I'm going to start, and I'm going to guess, so, you know, several of those top reviews are pretty high. I don't know if it's going to... I feel like it's going to be weighted to where, like, the funny reviews are going to get up to the top. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, but, I'm, but I think people are going to like it. So I'm going to go with a 3.7. Ooh, that's about where I wanted to go. Who's next, David? Uh, I guess I'll go next since we're tied, but it's your movie, so I'll, 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 uh, you know, I'll let you go last. You can have the final, the final spot on the board. Um, I'm gonna say a three point six. I'm gonna undercut Josh, but that was my guess to start with. So, mm. a three point six. Yeah, my guess was also a three point seven. I appreciate that we always Oof. enjoy such close things. So I am oh, yeah. just gonna try at this point in time to box Josh out and go with the 3.8. That's <laughs> the only way to go. <laughs> it's the only way to go, especially when we all had a pick within point one of each other. Um, all right, yep. so 3.7 for me, 3.6 for David, and 3.8 for Garrett. This week, um, we do have a direct hit, and we were all very wise to choose our areas, obviously. Um the direct hit goes to me for going first, though, because I picked 3.7. <laughs> there you go. Well, 3.7 is what the Letterbox community well done, is rated well this movie. And a direct hit. Hang on. Oh, yeah. What do you think, Garrett? What do I think my what, rating no, is? No, no, no. Like, what do you think you, about it? You th agree with that? That's pretty good. Oh. Pretty yeah, in line with what we said. I said I four. You guys right. said three and a half. Yeah, pretty much. Yep, yep. I say that's fair. I think that's fair too. This is what I would expect. It's yeah. Um, all right. Well. Well, and I agree. Uh, and well, no, I actually don't agree. But, uh, but that's that's fair. It's Slutterbox. Uh, Josh, that direct hit puts you in the lead now. Ooh. By one. You're up to five. Yeah, you're up to you're up to lead. You're in the lead by by one. I can't wait until it goes away. But I'm gonna enjoy it while <laughs> it lasts. You know what? The next, the next thing is we're gonna have to do a, a live rock paper scissor to s decide who goes first because we're all gonna be tied at some point. In time. I'm into that. I'm <laughs> it's into very that. possible. All right. Well, that wraps up this episode of So Many Sequels. We will be back next week with another A24 movie to review for A24 Pro. Uh, be sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. Our new subscriber goal is 137. We mm -hmm. are crawling up and up we are up to 124 right now so we are excited to have you guys joining us um uh, be sure to share the show with your friends um mm -hmm. subscribe to the podcast if you'd like to listen there wherever you get your podcasts you can go to so many sequels.com and get the list of all of our past episodes as well as links to our social channels which is facebook uh instagram tiktok and threads uh we'll see you guys next week